Good morning. This morning, we have the honor of having with us one of my personal favorite people, although this is the first time we've actually interacted directly with each other. Ken Lawson is not only an extremely highly respected criminal defense attorney and civil rights attorney, he is faculty in criminal law at the William S. Richardson School of Law at the University of Hawaii. He is the co-director and one of the founders of the Innocence Project here, which deals with excessive incarceration, <clears throat> wrongful sentencing, <clears throat> and other systemic problems. <clears throat> Ken, thanks. Welcome. Tell us a little bit about what brought you to where you are today. <laughs> that's, a, that's a long story, but uh, <laughs> we've been in Hawaii for, for 12 years, my wife and I, and um, um, I've been here at the university since 2010, and and uh, yeah, and so you know, I, I, as you mentioned earlier, I practiced law in Cincinnati, Ohio, um, for 18 years prior to coming here. The other, the, you know, the rest of the story I've I've done, you know, I've public talks on it before, so you know, people can go to my YouTube channel to get that part because uh, we only have a few minutes, and I think I think you know the topic that you want to discuss is extremely important. Um, so, yeah. So let's jump right in. What makes that topic, not just judicial independence and impartiality, but what's wrong with it, what's broken? What makes that topic so important and timely right now? Well I, well, I mean, it's been going on for years. It's been, it's been right. I think now the public, because of, you know, the protests and the focus on Black Lives Matter, unequal justice, and, and that global movement that we see now, right? That the centers on justice. It's almost like people are coming to where a lot of us have already been, right? It's, um, you know, like, oh my gosh, you know, is there judicial bias? And it, well, yeah, especially when you have them elected or they're, you know, here in Hawaii, if they're, you know, if they get uh, appointed through the ledge or, or you, know, uh, you know what I mean? They're reviewed by, you know, the state legislature and all that's political. And when it becomes political, then you see decisions that are political. Uh, you see people who are, who are supposed to be independent judges, free of any bias, free to rule on justice, afraid to do so because they don't want to, to upset the political party. They don't want to upset their voters, right? The people that put them in office. And normally what that means is it, when it comes down whether well, it's local here, Micronesian, Native Hawaiian, people of color, right? We need you, Judge, to protect us and those people. And you see them with longer sentences, et cetera. And so, um, hey, man, you know, when I practice law in Ohio, I mean, you, we've, and this is considered a liberal state, you know, in the Midwest, and you fight them judges all day long. Right, and they would know. They would know, man. They would know the cops was, you know. So, no, here, here's how you know when when a police officer. So, it, it, especially in the neighborhoods, right? You would, you would get clients that, that police pull up. Hey, what are you young men doing on the corner? I'll go after yourself. You can't tell us nothing, right? So, next thing you know, you got the disorderly conduct, resisting arrest, and assault the police. When you see those three charges, you kind of know. Because the whole, because it, it always goes back to what? Why did the officer even start talking to you? We were just standing on the corner, and then he told you what he said. Man, get out the corner, whatever. And I was like, you know, I know my rights. I don't have to move. And then it escalates. So now the judge knows that this is some BS. That there's really no crime here, other than one caused and created by the police coming in there, you know, starting stuff, and then charging the individual. And so you sit in court. Everybody knows the cop is lying. Judge know they line, prosecutor know the cop line, I know the cop line, my client knows the cop line because he was there, and the judge know it. And then there's still a guilty finding. Um, and, and, you know, getting back into the Innocence Project, um, you know, a lot of the wrongful convictions happens with misdemeanors, right? You got somebody that can't afford to get out on bond, they're charged with one of these frivolous charges, the judge knows some BS, man. I mean, you know, and in order to get out, I plead guilty and you, he'll let me go today with a fine. So now I have a record. And I've seen it with law students here. You know, the, you know, as, as you know, law students have to pass a, a character and fitness um, before they take the bar. 
part of that is, have you ever had any prior convictions? Some of them may say, you know, in high school or in college, you know, I got disorderly conduct at, at a frat party, you know, and, and, you know, the judge found me guilty. What were you doing? Well, I got drunk and I start, you know, calling the cop all kind of SOBs, <laughs> uh, you know, and I mean, anyway, so I think I kind of rambled on there and, and got off tangent, but I, going back to your original point, um, there is no, the closest we get is um, federal judges. And even then it becomes extremely political because in order to get the appointment, you have to have certain views. Um, and what we see going on now with, with President Trump in office and Mitch McConnell over the Senate, and while President Trump is distracting the whole world with, with idiotic tweets, everybody gets upset about that. Right. And, 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 you know, injecting Lysol to prevent COVID. And so we're talking about that for three days. And Mitch McConnell and his gang is appointing some of these judges that have no idea what justice means. Right. And part of them qualifying is to make sure that they told that, that, that far right wing agenda. And that has nothing to do with, with equal justice for all. In fact, if anything, it's the enemy of equal justice. For all. Absolutely. So I guess here's the question. If you look at the Trump McConnell appointments guided by the Federalist Society and the American Conservative, whatever that other group is, you see a clear pattern of not only right wing radical conservatives, but younger white men with histories of strong biases against minorities. LGBTQ, Black, Hispanic, disabled, whoever it may be. But, absolutely, and that's not by mistake. I mean, when you talk about make America great again, you we all know that that's that, that that's code for make America and keep America white. Yeah. Right. Him going to Tulsa this weekend. You know, basically, a after everybody knows that, well, now everybody should know the history of, of, of the uh, riots on Wall Street, right? And just, just killing black folks in, in Tulsa in 1921. And to have that as, as your sounding board. And then the move from North to down to Jacksonville, where there's another race, um, right? All that is cold, right? All the stuff about the Confederate flags and, and really the two decisions this week. Right uh, about the LGBTQ that and uh, the one this morning about DACA. All, all, were, all that is you know all that is done to try to uh, appease the far right, but also keep America white again. Right and and to keep and that's what the fear is. It's it's right and I think that's what's ironic about this whole global movement we're seeing, where you see white people, black people, brown people. Uh, Asian people all coming together saying Black Lives Matter, right? I mean, not just here, like normally, you know, I've been doing police misconduct cases when I did civil rights on the mainland, man, since my first one was in 1994. So I represented individuals that was killed by the police, Black unarmed men and women in Cincinnati and in the, you know, Kentucky and Indiana, tri-state area. And I did, you know, did it until I came here. And, but all of, all of the marches was always mainly just Blacks, right? The protests were Black people, you know, mainly. You know what I mean? Now this is just different. And I think it's different not only because of what people saw happen to George Floyd. I think it's different because of what people have, been, have seen has been happening to our nation, here locally, I mean, nationally and globally. That America is turning out to be racist. Right, at least in in a right from the administration, I mean, not the people. So, or the, there's this systemic racism that is coming across in what Trump is doing to build a wall and all the you know shithole countries and stuff like that. Um, and, and so, you know, it, it's, it doesn't surprise me that that the Federalists obviously are sitting there with a list of people that because you're, what's going to happen is the voting rights, you know, the gerrymandering and all that stuff that's going on is going to continue to be upheld. Because if they don't, if the country is becoming more uh, colored, so to speak, brown, white, right? Which means, and, and, his, and Latino and blacks and white, the only way that you can still stay in power is to dilute the vote. 
and, and, and the way you do that is you control the courts. So you can get away with voter suppression. You can get away with gerrymandering. Yeah, those just like, go ahead. Yeah. And those are racially biased decisions and actions as well, right? Absolutely. I mean, you know, back uh, a few years ago when Scalia, when, when they just dismantled the, the um, voter right, the Voting Right Act. I mean, it's just like, oh, everything is good now. Are you serious? And as soon as they did that, you saw every, all these states getting busy gerrymandering um, and, and creating districts to where it's just almost impossible um, to get some of these people out. So is what's happening to judicial independence and impartiality the attacks on that by Trump, McConnell, that whole group in the sector, is that as racially motivated as minority inimical as the police conduct that you're talking about? Oh, yeah. Maybe more subtle, but is uh, it really but the it, same it, thing? Yeah, it is the same. I mean, because look, and that was, that was, you know, that was my point earlier. The judges know what's going on in them streets, they, right? And so the only reason why a police officer would do some of the things that he that, that they do is because they know that once they bring these trumped up charges, once they say that you did it, or once they say that you resisted arrest, and that's why they beat you. Because see, when, it, it, when excessive force is used, and I know that I'm doing something as an officer that's illegally by beating someone who... I have no right to do. I have to charge them, right? And that that will justify what I'm doing. And most of these judges know um, th that all this is BS. But they they continue to do it. And and if they didn't, then we wouldn't see so many police bringing these trumped up charges. And it leads to a good number of wrongful convictions. Um, I mean, it's and the sentences. When you look at the disparity in, in the prison sentences between white and black, you know, when I did criminal law um, in the Midwest, people really don't know this, even though I was a black lawyer in a pretty racially divided state, about 40% of my clients were white. And they, 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 they would come out from, you know, the farmland. I mean, they would come out from the boonies, but they were just old country boys, country men and women, right? But they believed, you know, if they got charged, they believed in fighting. So they would come to me. And just being able to see the difference in the way my white clients was treated as compared to my black clients um, was just night and day, night and day. Night and day, you know, and I'm talking about some serious offenses, you know what I mean, to where, okay, well, this client's going to get probation. And then the same black client that does the same act uh, is in prison. Um, and so, yeah, all of it. And in is, this is judicial system in Hawaii, hey, we're sitting here thinking, oh, well, hey, we're exempt. We're a salad ball. We've got all kinds of ethnic groups. And so we don't have this problem. Hey, is that your perception? No, I mean, when you look at the Micronesian, look at the Micronesian population and a few years, I don't know if you remember this or not, but there was a prosecutor who, who made an argument to a judge, a closing argument, no, for sentencing. You need to sentence this Micronesian young man to prison and teach all of them down there a lesson, right? And, and, and it got reversed at the Court of Appeals. But for any prosecutor to feel comfortable enough to put on the record something so racist and for a judge not to at the trial level, not to say, hey, you know what? I, you know, new prosecutor, we start over or what have you, you know, or you can't say that, I'm not gonna consider that. For that just to go on, um, lets you know that, that the racism is there. You know, people talk about implicit bias. Uh, and I tell you, you know, I have written a law review article on it in 2015. Um, but, you know, after Trump took office, I'm, I'm really, you know, this stuff is conscious. You know, as a judge who's in front of you, you know, as a police officer, that man you just shot in the back is black. You know that? You, you shot him. You know what I mean? Or you know that because you just sentenced the man. You got the, the PSI in front of you before you come out to sentence. You see his, his, his race, his nationality. Um, you, and you see his record. You see where he comes from. So it, your decision is conscious, right? So what's going to 
bring about real change in the erosion of that judicial independence and impartiality? What's going to change the playing field and level it? I, I think it should just be merit-based. I, I think, you know, um, and there's always been a debate about that. I, I really, like where I'm from, judges are, are elected. They, they run in, in you know, um, and we lived in a majority white county, so our, our county judges uh, were always white and they were always former prosecutors. You know what I mean? All, I mean, um, um, and I don't know if you remember, it's, it's an, uh, Judge Nathaniel Jones, he passed away, but he, he, he has a, it's a federal court building and he was a Sixth Circuit Court of Appeals judge, he was an NAACP lawyer. Uh, and, and he worked with Thurgood Marshall and a lot of those guys and he was in Cincinnati and he bought a lawsuit um, that allowed our municipal court judges to be elected within the city of Cincinnati, not the county where more blacks are located. So we started getting more black judges. Um, but going back to your point, I, I think we have to come up with some type of merit base instead of being appointed by the ledge. I don't know how it would work, um, but you, there, there's some systems that have, you know, where, where the judges are appointed based on merit, where you take into account the local bar, every, you know, criminal defense lawyers, prosecutors and stuff like that. And they're evaluated every few years. Um, but it's just the politics. So our Judicial Selection Commission here in Hawaii, based originally on the Missouri model, is supposed to do that. But they give a list of six to the governor, the governor then picks one, and, and they still have to get Senate approval of that. So you've got two political levels involved in the final selection process. That list of six it may have some really highly qualified, independent, impartial people, respected people on there, but whether those people get the final selection and governor approval and Senate approval is another question. Right, right. How do you think we're doing on that? I, th I, think, I, I think it sucks. Um, you know, I, I see judges here scared to make decisions because, it, you know, it's almost like having somebody, you know, if, if I do this, what would they do? And so you're not, you're not looking so much, so it, it, it takes the focus off ju justice and keeps the focus on you keeping your position, right? When a judge is sitting there, he or she should be able to focus solely on justice, not whether or not how my ruling is gonna affect my job. And when you enter, when, 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 when it's made clear, because the ledge is made clear, over the last few years that your job may depend on what, how you rule, right? right? Not on, you, so justice is not your job. Your job is to make sure we're happy with you. And if we're happy with what you're doing, we're not gonna remove you from that seat. And so you're sitting there at, 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 our, at the mercy of us and we will tell you what justice is. Right? So let's look at that right here in Hawaii. Off the top of my head, I can think of three really strong, very independent judges that I have a great deal of aloha and respect for from my 42 years of practice, all of whom were not renewed because they offended the wrong groups. All three are women. All three are people of color. Yeah. And, and that's the whole point. Right. And so how, how is that justice? And, and I think, I think you know, the more that we shine light on this, the more young people and, and other people have come. Look, we saw 10,000 people at the Capitol when I spoke down there at the Black Lives Matter. And these people hadn't flown in from over. These are 10,000 people on Oahu. Then you had marches over there. You know how many young people of color and, and white, black, if we just use that power to vote to get some of these legislatures out of there and put people in it that are progressive that understand what justice is and then then they, they can appoint if, if this is a system we're going to keep they can at least point somebody and say you know what that's your job to be the judge you're qualified you go be the judge and as long as we we trust you to, to do what's in your but we may not agree with everything you say but the fact that you're the judge and you should be independent go with our blessing you know what i mean um, i do but we and, and so i hope that people can see with this movement, that it doesn't just end with protests, right? That's the beginning. The end has to be go vote, register to vote, check your registration, um, and get some of these people out of there. And then if we don't like that, then change it. But you're absolutely right, man. I mean, that is so unjust.
I mean, it, it, I mean, it pisses me off because the, the bottom line is when, 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 when you have a system like that, see, this is why they can't say, hey, you, you know, what did these Kalohas come from? They're so crooked. Well, you created them. You created them. This, this corrupt system you got allows corruption to persist. And the only reason why y'all talking about them now is because they got caught. But you knew they was no good when you had them in there. You knew they was no good when y'all was doing tit for tat deals. See, when they fired Chuck Toto over there when he was doing the investigation and got rid of him to help cover up them, and then they want to give this man $250,000 uh, to, to retire after he'd been indicted by a federal grand jury. And then when we when a judge stands up and says something is wrong, this is then they get removed. And people want to sit back and say, you know, what's going on with the corruption in our government? Well, it's your, your corrupt government created the corruption that we see in. And my point is this, as long as you have judges that are down there, that are ruling based on what they think the ledge likes, you're going to see justice um, being uh, thwarted. And we look at that and we're still seeing that as we look at it today. Right. Two leading police commissioners, probably the two most independent and respected police commissioners, Steve Levinson and Loretta Sheehan, quit because yeah. they can't be effective. I mean, it, I mean, it's so corrupt. Don't, please don't give me, I mean, there's an article in there to um, one of the, I just, some news show about the, the rail spending $190,000 on some type of game. I don't, the whole thing, look, when when you have Justice Levinson and the, I forget, forget the sister. Loretta name, Sheehan. Loretta, right? I mean, they're trying to do their job to make the police better. And, and see, what happens is this, the police union, they don't like it. And so they'll put you in a position to where if you say something about us, you're anti-police. If you say something about us, that means you want crime to rise. And somehow if, if we, re, if, all this stuff happens. And so now they appoint Doug Chan and whoever else this guy is, and it's going to be more of the same. And Doug, and you know, I, I, I know he may watch his show, or whatever, and I really don't give a shit. I'm just telling you that they're, they're putting him in there. At, hey, man, look. I, I mean, people should be upset enough to go vote. People should be upset enough to go vote. Yeah. And I think it will be interesting because I've known Doug Chan and Mike Broderick for some time now. and they're people of conscience. They're people of con character. My yeah, but they're, but, but, they're, but they're so pro police. You're right. This, right. And so I'm not saying that, 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 that they don't have good character. What I'm saying is they're so far to the, to the right of the police that they can't see when we say Black Lives Matter what it means. They can't see when Micronesians may have to say Micronesian Lives Matter. What does that mean? All, you know, they told the line of, of the blue. And, and again, we all do that, but what we want is a good blue, right? We want we want a community and a police that works together, not against each other. That when there's a police shooting, we sh there should be open records, and that's not going to happen. So you know, I don't I don't want to come across like I'm impugning a, I'm not impugning a character. What I'm saying is, if you want somebody to make sure that the police department is doing what they're doing, you don't put somebody in there who who's not going to disagree with the police department. You put somebody, you know, iron sharpens iron. That friction, you need that. If, if you want to make it better. Now, if you just want to keep going on and not make it better, keep putting in the same old people that's going to rubber stamp it. And we see that's also a political appointment. I think the choice of Doug Chin and Mike Broderick is about as favorable as we might expect from that political appointment process. So we'll see right. what happens. But that's only two. And we also saw what happened was Loretta Sheehan, who was the most independent member on that police commission, was removed as chair and replaced with someone who's been very favorable to the police, to the Shopo Union, and to Captain Valley. What's well, uh, an appointment? Not any of those people, but yeah. if you've tell, got a power, tell, 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 tell them I want. Tell them I want. I want the third seat. Let, Charles, you got you got any connections down there? Tell them Lawson said he wants to be the third seat on there. Yeah. Um. <laughs> you know, as as the '60s guy, I'm completely comfortable with that. I couldn't agree with you more, Ken. Until we have real diversity, not just apparent diversity, not just superficial diversity, but real diversity on the decision-making bodies, 
whether it's judicial appointment, whether it's the bench itself, the judiciary. And, and I think if there's one thing that gives me personally some hope, I think we have a state Supreme Court and a state chief justice who seriously, conscientiously honor equal access to equal justice. I think and, C.J. Rechtenwall, yes. Sabina McKenna, Richard yes. Pollack, Mike Wilson, Paula Nakayama. I wouldn't trade those five for any Supreme Court in the country. Hey, Matt, you know, I'm on a National Innocence Network board with Barry Sheck and a whole bunch. Of, and I get calls all the time. Like, you guys are so blessed to have such a great Supreme Court. And that's absolutely true. Absolutely true. Hey, and maybe that's cause for hope, because if this process, hey, and these leadership people can make that possible, maybe there's room. Where do you think the real momentum for change has to come from? Is it from the youth? Is it from the younger generation? Yeah, so in that power of that vote. Like Malcolm X said, man, it's either the ballot or the bullet. And we ain't got enough bullets, so it's the ballot, right? And it's the power of that vote. You know, you go down here to, um, I mean, both of you and I, we, we old guys, man. You go down to the state ledge, man, I walk around in there, you smell Geritol, it's just, it smells like, you know, uh, I mean, hey, man, we need some more young people down there. <laughs> Geritol and salon pots and denture cream. <laughs> it might be mine, it might be mine. So we're down to about the last minute or so, Ken. <laughs> Coming back to what's wrong with judicial independence and impartiality, any last thoughts? No, I, no, I, I just think that the more that people see it, right, the more that we can shine a light on why this really affects a lot of people's lives in a negative way, um, th then we can get that change. People get motivated to change when they can see this is really wrong and it's really affecting people in the wrong way. Couldn't agree more. If we do, what does it look like? You know, it, I, I don't know, but it can't be the same old system. It has to It has to be more independent. You know, judges should just, you know, I would like something like, I mean, I don't know, but it has to be some merit-based system where the, the local bar and the local lawyers who practice in front of these judges, not the ones who never see the judge. You know, you got lawyers who practice and, and you know, just in probate court, but they don't see the, the, the criminal and civil judges down here, right? Those people should really have like an input in whether or not the judges have, have merited the right to stay. Okay, so we're gonna wrap up here. I'm gonna leave it with one other thing. There is another element we haven't gotten into today, maybe next time, which is the media. We are losing some of our absolutely best, most independent, articulate, respected people, Lee Canaluna, Rob Perez, two of our best investigative writers. That needs to be part of this as well, because without that kind of watchdog input, yeah. change gets harder. Ken, thanks so much for your time. Let's do this again. And yeah, I enjoyed it. Really appreciate it. Thank you. Take good care. You too.